my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Put on, on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Thank you. 
Jesus, bring forth my people. He replied, Lord, who am I? Often we look inwardly. We fail to see as God can see. God told Moses, I'll be with you. I am that I am. Go forth. The harvest is great, but the laborers few. Will you go work in his fields? Can you hear the cries of lost souls begging to be saved from sin? It may cost you everything, but you will gain eternally. Do not fear, step out in faith, surrender to God's call. see what God continues to do here at Calvary and praise the Lord for it. I just thank God over and over and over again that he gave you this place and has brought you out in the public eye and God has honored that decision. I believe in what I see. I love your preacher and his wife. They're special to us. I have a prayer list. Actually, I'm building a little prayer book that I keep with me and Brother Dave Spears and Elizabeth, they're part of that prayer list that I remember. And when you get my age, a mystery happens. Nighttime is long, but sleep is short. And so I take the opportunity to pray through my preacher friends and missionary friends. And this amazing thing of what happens is the devil gets involved and he doesn't like you to pray, so he puts you to sleep. And, but I do pray for them and thank the Lord for it. Thank you for the privilege of being here today and how I ask God to bless our time together. Take your Bible with me this morning, if you would please, and turn to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, and turn to Psalm 92, if you would, uh, with us. And we're going to read that here in just a moment. But you notice that I've asked Sister Spears to stay at the piano, and I want her to sit there just for a little bit. And uh, we're going to get together here in just a few minutes. But I want to preach on this thought. I talked to your preacher earlier this week, and um, I asked him, I said, is there anything special that you want to ask of me? And, and he said, well, son, not really. He said, but I am thinking about you know, the time change and maybe a fresh start and things of that nature. So I want to bring our thoughts together today on this subject, the need of being renewed and uh, not stale, 
not normal to what always has been, but having something fresh and new that God has for us, and He always does. And we want to look at that. Renewed, it means to make like new, restore to freshness, vigor, to make new spiritually. So I want us to look at Psalm 92. And so, sis, if you'll just bear with me a little bit. And uh, it's not like she's not used to the piano bench. I'll guarantee the hours that God's recorded for her. So I want us to read the entire psalm. And uh, then we are going to come back, and there's a purpose that I've asked Sister Elizabeth to be there for. So let's look at Psalm 92, verse 1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound, for thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy works. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies. And my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth, still bring forth fruit in the old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Must bow for prayer. Dear Jesus, meet with us today, I pray. Consume and fill this auditorium with your sweet presence. Dear God, may we not be able to deny the presence of the Holy Spirit and pray for his activity in our lives, each and every one. Father, I give myself afresh and anew to you today asking, dear Jesus, that I would be well held and controlled in the hands of the lovely God. And that, Lord Jesus, you would use me for the benefit of those that are here. Open hearts, open minds. And Father, may we leave change to the glory of God and we'll be careful to praise you for it in Jesus, our sweet Savior's name. Now go back with me to verse 1, would you please? The psalmist said, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto the name, O Most High God. We have a thought of doing a good thing in verse 1. Give thanks, it says, to give thanks. So I want us to do that together this morning with the intention of being renewed and refreshed. I want us to sing two little courses. And uh, I'm not a song leader. I'm not anything, really, to be honest with you. So I believe that you know these courses. I believe you surely know the first one quite easily. And if you haven't learned the second one, we'll kind of try to teach it to you. And, and you can take it home because it's in your Bible. So I want us to take a Bible and turn over. Now, stay with me in Psalm somehow. Turn over to Psalm 48, would you please? Psalm 48. But the first little course we want to sing, and we want our hearts to be involved in this because what we want to do this morning has everything to do with what I want to bring in our message this morning. I want us to stand with your Bible and I want you and I to sing as Sis over here plays the piano. And the first little course we're going to sing together as we stand is 
Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, full and free. Allow me to ask you this this morning. When's the last time you just sang this to the glory of God? Because you have been caught up in the reality, He saved you. And you're excited about the relationship that you have in Jesus. And let's just thank Him today. Would you do that? Let's sink it out of our heart. You say, but I'm not good at singing. I don't care if you can sing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you growl. But let's just whistle or something to the glory of God. Thank you, Lord for saving my soul. So let's sing it together. Would you lift it up now? Let's sing it one more time. Get it out of our heart to the glory of God. Allow me to ask you something. This is going to be wonderful. It's just us here today, so put up with me for a few minutes. Isn't it going to be wonderful when faith becomes sight and we see Him as He is and in our translated body that will be perfect, we're going to be able to look at the all-lovely one and thank Him. What a day. What a day that'll be. Let's thank Him this morning. Not just sing. Let's thank Him. All right, let's sing. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Amen. Now, let's let's turn to the songbook of songbooks, Psalm 48. Psalm 48, and we're going to sing the first two verses of Psalm 48. How many of you know this chorus and have sung it? Any of you? A few of you. Man, we got the work cut out for us. Sis, you know this song? I intend to hear you. You got to help me. Dave, you know what? We'll pray for the preacher. All right. Let's, let's sing it. And you may want to listen to it a little bit. Babe, help me, honey. Okay. Are you ready? Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. The mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, a joy of earth. It's on the sides of the north and south of our great All right, now I have an excuse. I'm deaf. I wear hearing aids, and uh, they help, but they don't cure. And I don't always hear my note. So I can really make songs curious. And uh, I I think I did this a little bit. But we're just singing to the Lord. Isn't the Lord great? And greatly to be praised. In the city of our God. In the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situations. Have you ever had a situation? Yeah. And found God beautiful in it. In the midst of it. He may not have changed the situation, but he proved himself in it. God's faithful. Amen. All right? You're doing great. I'm proud of you. <laughs> All right. Did, did you learn anything that time, preacher? Oh, I'm proud of you. All right. Prayer's working over here. 
Oh, let's, let's sing it again. All right. Verse 1 of Psalm 92. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O most holy God. You may be seated. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. You know, if we were to look at this Psalm of Psalm 92, I want us to look at it very, very quickly, and I'm just going to do this briefly. If we were to outline this psalm, let me give you three major thoughts, three major points of this psalm. Now, I'm going to give it to you so you understand the psalm, but I'm not going to preach the outline. I've got another one. But let's look at Psalm 92, and I'm not going to really deal with it much other than give you these three points. If we were to outline it, Verses 1 through 5 is blessings and praise to God. Blessings and praises to God. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Just lift your voice and praise the Lord. This should enrapture us enough to stop to realize this. When Jesus saved me, that nixes ever the possibility of me going to hell. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to stand up and wave a hanky and just praise the Lord. Yeah, and then verses 6 through 10 is the brutish and the foolish person are going to come to destruction. God's keeping the record and the foolish and the brutish people that are God deniers, God blasphemers, whatever you want to put in there, God's going to judge them. He's keeping the record. Fret not, the psalmist says in in Psalm 37. And then verses 11 through 13 is the blessed portion of God's redeemed people. God has a reward. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So that's how that psalm breaks out as you read it. Now, here's what you're going to notice. If you look at the heading of this psalm, it does not give credibility to who wrote it. Some believe Moses wrote it. Some believe Asaph wrote it. Some believe that David wrote it. But I don't know who wrote it. I just know that it's in the canon of Scriptures because God put it there. And He has something that He wants us to listen to. Psalm 107, verse 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And there's a song that says this, I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. I've been redeemed. My question to you today is this, can you take yourself back to a time in your life when you realized you were a sinner in need of a Savior and repentance and faith said yes to Jesus Christ. Greatest understanding that you ever have, greatest truth that you'll ever accept, and the greatest fact that you'll ever say yes to is what you do with Jesus Christ. Redeemed. And then I got to thinking at my desk yesterday as I was working on trying to freshen and straighten this message up. I got to thinking about another song, and I'm going to read it to you. I'm not going to make you tolerate me. But the words are worth listening to. Now, you are a person here today. You've been saved, born again in the Spirit of God. I want you to get caught up in this and rejoice. If you're here today and you're not sure relationship, you can be as you listen to this song. 
It's an old song. It was written way back in the early 1900s and by Fanny Crosby. And she penned this, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child, and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of His presence with me doth continually dwell. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I sing, for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. I know I shall see in His beauty the King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child, and forever I am. And let all the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful truth? To be born again. These things have written unto you that believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you may know, that you may know that you're saved. What we find in Christ. Now, I want to observe three areas of our lives that we need renewal in. Everybody, everybody gets stale. Everybody does. But you know, Jesus said this in Matthew 5. He says, ye are the salt of the earth. We, the Christian, is give, we are the ones that give flavor to who Christ is. And if salt has lost its savor, it'll be cast out and trodden upon of men. May I say something very carefully and cautiously this morning? I'm afraid that's where we're at. We are a body of people, not us here particularly, but Christianity as a whole has become full of antics and entertainment and Christ has been hid behind the tapestry of mankind when in truth it's all about Him. All of it is about Him. We need refreshment. If the world needs anything, they need truth. And the only way they ever see truth is what we express in the integrity of our lives. Let me give you three areas in which we need to be renewed. First of all, we need to be renewed in our faith. In our faith. Now there's two areas of faith that I want to give you this morning. First of all, the need of faith in salvation. To be born again of the Spirit of God. I was reading, and not only reading, but I was listening to someone speak the other day, and their voice was a voice of reminiscing. They were talking about how it used to be. Well, you know, I lived some of those days in my youth, but it's been true that what America needs, and you hear it, oh, how we need revival. My dear friend, it's not God that's the problem, it's the church that is the problem. Revival is something that comes into the life of an individual and it becomes infectious to those around and they get to be participants in what God is doing. Oh, that we might be. You know, you say, but preacher, we're a smaller congregation. Oh, get that out of your head. Let me tell you what God says, where two or three are gathered together. That's a pretty small congregation, but God says, if just two or three gather together in my name, He promises to do something. And I pray to God that something will take place today that a life that maybe is here, never been born again, the Spirit of God doesn't have the assurance of salvation. And if you were to die today, you would die and go to hell without, hell without hope and without mercy. And the desire of your heart would be pricked of the Holy Spirit that you would want to say yes to Christ. 
that He would do it and you would allow Him to do it. Salvation in Christ, Ephesians 2.8, says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God's gift is two-parted, that is, He gives you salvation by giving you the gift of faith to believe. And Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No one that has ever desired Jesus Christ as the Lord of the life and the Savior of soul has ever gone to Him to be rejected or turned away. Whosoever shall come unto the, unto the Christ shall be saved. That's God's warranty and God's guarantee. If you're not saved here today, you present yourself to the Savior and He'll give you salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I was reading an article just this past week, and I can't tell you where it is, or if I could, I would. But it was about someone was, that was well known, and if I'm not mistaken, it was a Hollywood character that recently passed away. And they were talking to their family and they were then this person before they died made this stop, this comment somewhat like this if i could live my life over what i would want more than anything i would want peace the world is crying for peace and they've shut out the prince of peace from their life and they've sought it down the avenues of dan ed streets that afford them promises, but no delivery. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. My dear friend, you cannot take a journey to Jesus Christ and go away disappointed. He always gives you what you need and more of it. So we need a renewal of the preaching of the cross, the preaching of repentance, the preaching of salvation, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's always been true, and it is true this morning as well. And thankfully you have found yourself in a congregation and in a station where we believe in the preaching of this place, believes that Christ has saved, does save, and will continue to save if you'll just ask Him. And then not only... Salvation or to faith, but in faith. That's after salvation. That's our living and that's our service unto God. Matthew 17, 20 says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto the mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Now, I know that I've heard people say, it's just a little faith. It doesn't take much faith. But my dear friend, that's true, but I don't believe that's the emphasis of what Matthew is trying to get us to understand. It is not talking about the amount of faith. It's talking about a living faith. A living faith that is active. It may be small as a mustard seed, but if you realize that that is a living thing and you plant it, it flourishes into a tree that God says birds seek to live in. A living faith where I believe God, I take God at His word. He is fresh to me as He was when I first believed. He's as exciting to me more so today than he was in my young faith. Because not only has that faith been living, but it has been increasing. Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith. It shows us what has been accomplished by the host of people listed there because they had faith. Faith believing, now remember this, faith believing produces action. Look with me, if you would, please, over to James and hold your hand in, in Psalm 92. <laughs> but look over with me in James in the New Testament. You find Hebrews and then you will find James right after that. <laughs> James chapter 2 
in verses 17 and 18. Look what it says. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. What James is trying to get us to understand is that, dearly beloved, you say you have faith. Then somewhere faith as a living thing must produce something active in our life to indicate that we have that faith. So you say this morning, I'm a born-again believer. I trusted Christ. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. I'm His child. I love Him. And I have that harbored in my heart by faith. That my dear friend, somewhere that faith, being a living faith, has got to reveal itself in the style of our living in our words that we form and in sentences that we say, our faith is an active thing that proves Christ is real on our life. But not only that, let me give you this illustration. I may have done that here before, but I have a sister. She's in heaven now. And I've given this illustration, but tolerate me just a minute. She never married. She was an old maid when she went home to be with the Lord. She never wanted to be married. And, but she, she had a little Pekingese dog. And it was meaner than 411 devils. It'd bite you, chew on you. And, and, but it loved her. And she, would, uh, she fed it like she was feeding a human. And one day I was watching her. that She had its own plate that had dividers in it. And she, she had all the types of food that you should eat. She had a meat, and she had a vegetable, and she had a salad. I mean, that's how she fed that crazy dog. And uh, that dog sat and wait, wait, wait for her to fix it, and she would talk. His name was Spanky. And uh, she would talk to Spanky, and he'd get all excited as she was fixing his plate of food. And I was sitting there watching her one day. Man, that looked good. <laughs> and uh, I said, Sis... Fix me a plate just like that. She said, well, Roger said, that's the dog's food. I just said, I don't care if it is. I said, man, that looks good. <clears throat> Fix me a plate of that. She said, are you sure? I said, I, I, I'm sure as can be. I said, I'm hungry. That looks good. Fix me a plate just, just like that. She's all right. So she did. It wasn't as good as I thought it would be. But what I'm trying to say is this. She made it look good enough to eat. Now, I'm using that illustration to say this. You say you're a Christian. You say you're a lover of Christ. You say you're a possessor of the Holy Spirit. You say you've been born again of the Spirit of God. And that has become a verbal testimony of yours among friends and the lost community. Are you making Jesus look good enough to want? But I'm going to say this, unlike the dog food that was not as good as I thought it would be, Jesus is the best. There's no disappointment in Christ. Taste of the Lord and see that He is good. Oh, that we may be renewed in our faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 12, it says this, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. We are to be examples to others what faith is and can be and can do when it's active in our life. Have you ever stopped to consider this and rejoice in this truth? First Corinthians 6 tells us in verses 19 and 20 that we are occupiers of the person of the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that God, the person of the Holy Spirit, indwells every individual here that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ? I never am without Him. No wonder the Word of God says 
that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I have the person of the Holy Spirit in my heart. Now, I don't know, you may think I'm silly, but I talk to Him. I'll go through the day and maybe I'm lonely or maybe I have a thought or maybe I have a question and I'll say, Holy Spirit, You're in me and You're not only to dwell there, but You are to fill me, You are to control me, You are to guide me into all truth. And I have this question. As I clear my mind of all that is around me, can you meet this need and make my day? He never disappoints me. He is a constant companion. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 gives us that truth. Then not only do we need a renewing in our faith, but we need a renewing in our spirit. Psalm 51 and verse 10, a prayer of David. David says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The word right means proper. It means faithful. It means to come to spiritual maturity. Not to think as a child or act as a child, And Paul said, when I was a child, I behaved or I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Our society, our world, our family that is unsaved, they need to see spiritual adults living in their presence. That we are mature in Christ. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why would it say that? Because God did not redeem this. I'm still wrapped in the sinfulness of the man that I am. But inside me lives an eternal spirit, this my spirit, And it says His Spirit bears witness with my spirit. That what gives me conviction. It forms standards. It gives me direction in my life. Because I'm not my own. I belong to Him. Oh, that we would have a renewed spirit in our lives. Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded, that is within the flesh, it is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Can I ask you something like this? How does your day go? Any given day. Is every day a perfect day? Now you better be honest with me like I'm going to be honest with you. No, it isn't. Matter of fact, few days are perfect, if any. Every day, somewhere, I run into the adversary. As a matter of fact, He desires to be my companion when I don't desire Him. But He's always around to cause me issues and problems. How many of you can relate to that? Everybody here. You have that issue. Something comes up and maybe it's something that's not good. And you know what He does? Makes us not think good. He makes us think evil. He makes us think things that are not kind and not gracious and not forgiving. And when we get in that mode of life and we try to the pretense of of talking to God, God shuts His ear. And we found that out in Sunday school this morning. God will not hear us. He will not respond to us when we give our life to iniquity or evil thoughts. That's the reason the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the Word of God. Do you know the one of two things that Satan cannot contend with? There's two things that he cannot contend with. He cannot contend when you bombard heaven and talk to God. He cannot stand in the avenue in the presence of a praying soldier. But secondly, he cannot deal and defend himself with Scripture. Remember when Jesus was tempted of the devil and he was on the backside of the desert and Satan came to him and he tempted him? He was there 40 days and 40 nights and he was weak 
the Bible says. And that's when the devil comes into our life more predominantly when we are weak and in the flesh. And Satan came and he began to tempt Jesus Christ. What was the Lord's defense? As it is written. As it is written. And you know what the Bible says? That Satan departed. But now wait a minute, you better read the rest of it. He departed for a season. He's going to come back because he's leaving to think up another way, another method that he can come into your life and bring defeat, discouragement, and disappointment to you. Oh, that we would have a renewing of our spirit with a renewed determination to stand up, do right, and fight, and having done all to stand, stand. Ephesians chapter 6, putting on the whole armor of God. And then we need to have a renewed strength. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Nehemiah chapter 8 in the last part of verse 10 says the joy of the Lord is your strength. As a matter of fact, there's one New Testament book that that's all that it talks about. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, and that's the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord. Is Jesus Christ your strength, your stay, your excitement, your song? Oh, that we may, according to Psalm 92, do a good thing and be thankful unto the Lord, and sing praises to Christ. When you get down, sing. When you get discouraged, sing. When you get disappointed, sing. When you're hurt, sing to the glory of God and watch God react to a joyful heart. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, Paul is in a fix physically and he prays and asks God, to remove the thorn of the flesh. And Jesus talks and He says, He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you know what that verse is saying? In the times of doubt and weakness, I become the greatest potential. Because it is not me, it is is His strength through me. Oh, that we would be soldiers of the cross. And it says that His power may rest upon me. If you were to look at the meaning of the word rest there, it means the power of Christ descending upon, working within, and giving me the help to do what is needed. Ephesians 3.16, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. That's where we need it, not physically. Oh, it's nice to be strong. And I remember when I had a little bit more than I do. Those were enjoyable days. But my dear friend, I would like to tell you, and this is just bragging on Jesus, I don't know when other than this moment that the strength of God is greater in my life than it is presently. To the glory of God, the inner man. Do you know that's where Satan fights us? Is inside us how we think? Not necessarily how I feel. But my emotions mentally can be well in His hands and I can live a defeated life when we need God's Spirit renewed in us in the power of His strength and His might. Colossians 1.11 says, Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now let's conclude this. Go back to Psalm 92. And let's look at verse 10. Let's look at verse 10. In the first part of this chapter, we have singing and glory and praise unto God. Then we have God's judgment. But in the middle of this, the psalmist, whomever he is, 
says this, but. You know what that means? Listen, I'm getting ready to say something, and it's worthy of saying. He says, but my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. My horn. What is he talking about? Well, that's always been a little bit of confusion to me, not understanding it totally. But here's what he's talking about. He's talking my strength, my courage, my victory, my praise will be made predominant that it will be seen in and through my life that God gets the attention of what he's doing in and through me. Isn't that what we're about? Isn't that what we're for? Listen to me. It's dark out there. I really don't enjoy listening to the news. When's the last time have you listened and something good be told? Rare. It's a downer. It's a depressant. It is not happy. It is nothing to make you feel hunky-dory. Everybody is mad at everybody. The world's falling apart. Everyone hates America. Americans hate America. It's amazing to me, where can I go but to the Lord? That's it. And here's what the psalmist is saying. My horn. God will lift up my strength. He will lift up my courage. He will lift up my victory. He will reveal my praise. He will fill me up because He is going to fill me and anoint me with fresh oil. Oh, how we need that. How this church needs that. How this community needs this. That we would make ourselves available to God and this morning we would see the understanding of this psalm and hopefully the weakness of this this message to the point where we would say, do it again, God. Do it again. And I start here. I give myself for that activity. Philippians 2.5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, that we would think like Him and that God would set this place on fire one more time. That somebody would come to see why it's burning. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Please, dear Lord, take the weakness of what I've tried to say and anoint it with Your sweet Spirit and give it clarity and authority in our minds and in our heart. Give it a hunger for us to desire that fresh oil, a newness, a renewing, and that, Father, we would be placed higher than the circumstances. Oh, God, work in the hearts of this people today, I pray, with all thanksgiving, and we ask it in Jesus' name.